welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today is another bite-sized episode and again a request from a lovely listener. So this episode is going to be all about helping your child find balance with eating and developing a healthy body image. So the question that's come from my listener is, I think I've had disordered eating since I was around 11. I've dieted on and off and have my own issues. However, I have a three-year-old boy and I want to make sure I'm not passing any of my toxic thoughts, language or behavior around food onto him. How do I effectively parent him but using the correct language? He, like me, has a really sweet tooth. And if I allowed him to, he would eat nothing but biscuits and sweets. How do I limit him? I'm not trying to stop him altogether, but just educate him that he can't have three adult-sized triple chop cookies, but without passing on the same issues as I have inbuilt from years of diet culture. For example, he loves hot chocolates with marshmallows and cream, and I say he's only allowed one and not three a day. I currently say that marshmallows and cream are yummy, but they're not very good for our teeth or our tummies, but I'm not sure if this is correct. So I think really, really great question. And I think something that so many of us struggle with, and I know myself working as an eating disorder therapist with all the training I've had, with all the work I have done on my own relationship with food, is this has still been quite a challenging area for me in terms of parenting and supporting my own three children. So it can feel like an insurmountable task to get it right with your child in helping them to develop a healthy body image and balanced eating habits. Because on the one hand, we hear daily daily scaremongering news of the dangers of your child becoming overweight or eating too much sugar. And simultaneously, we are also terrified of our child developing an eating disorder and becoming too thin. And the culture and environment do not support our efforts with tasty processed food available in abundance, while at the same time we continue to be bombarded by perfected social media images. And this discrepancy alone creates an unhelpful backdrop for trying to develop healthy attitudes towards body image and eating. Now, I just want to say that as a therapist, I specialize in treating adults with eating disorders. I'm not a child specialist. I do feel though that I have some insight and knowledge from the many adults I've worked with and the childhood experiences they have talked about. I also do have three teenagers, one girl and two boys, who on the whole have healthy food relationships. However, I'll be absolutely upfront and say that they have also navigated periods of unease with food, thankfully which have never been too long lasting. So with the best will in the world, the home environment and parenting are massively influential, but your child is also going out into a diet culture world, has access to social media, and particularly as they reach the teenagers, peer influence becomes far more credible and worthy than your pearls of wisdom. So listening to your well-intentioned parent is the last thing you're going to want as a teen. And actually, as a parent, if you push your point of view too hard, it can in fact be quite detrimental and encourage rebellion. And I think I found this all really incredibly frustrating myself because I've thought, I'm here with all my intuitive eating tips and wisdom and um, body neutrality, et cetera, et cetera. And my teenagers just roll their eyes and um, are just quite mean to me, really. Um, They don't want to hear it from their mother. So I think it's quite a delicate balance, really, to be passing on good messages, but also not to be kind of ramming it down our children's necks as well. So also, I want to mention as well that if your child has autism or ARFID or has celiacs or has some feeding issues, you know, some of these more general tips might be quite limited. So I just want to say as well, always seek professional help if you're struggling and don't go it alone. So what can you do to help support your child? Okay, so number one, being a role model and looking after you. Now, this can feel like such an overwhelming responsibility. However, I have found with parenting, and I'm sure you may relate to this too, that what you actually do has much more impact often than what you say. 
Now, my listener, as with many of us as parents today, we've been brought up in diet culture and we've been massively influenced by toxic messages, consciously and unconsciously. So it's quite likely as a parent that your relationship with food may not be the best. We have generations influenced by diet culture in a detrimental way. So what's really important as well is that you need to have compassion for yourself here being aware of this, knowing that you're working on yourself and being a good enough parent is enough. So by doing things like modeling regular eating, sitting down to eat, taking time for yourself to eat, having family meals where this is possible around life, practicing food neutrality, not talking about your body in a negative way, practicing self-care and looking after your mental and physical well-being. So looking after yourself and being a good role model is the number one tip, absolutely, because your children will observe what you do and soak this up like a sponge. They will emulate your habits and they will notice how you take care of you. Now, if you're struggling with an eating disorder as a parent, do get help. Remember as well, you only need to be good enough as a parent. If you're not talking about diets or berating your body, These two things alone are going to be helpful and probably a very different experience to the one you may have had growing up. You are your child's role model, so if you regularly as well critique your body in front of your child, if you're jumping off and on the weighing scales and are openly dieting, your child will be absorbing these messages. You might have your own personal struggles with food and your body and that's okay, be compassionate. And if you are really struggling, really try to minimize your child's exposure to these things. And do get support if you're finding these issues particularly challenging. So it's a tough one, isn't it? I think um, there's such a lot of responsibility on us as parents. But just to say, you know, if you are taking the little steps to just really take care of you, to model looking after yourself, even those little simple things like, making sure you're eating regularly, making sure you're taking time for yourself, your child is going to be observing these things and soaking them up. And when I look back on my own journey, you know, I had bulimia for a number of years, but pre my bulimic days, um, I am incredibly grateful to my mum, who really supported me in my early life with having a good relationship with food, you know, just providing home cooked meals. We always had food available. Nothing was good and bad. She sort of modeled regular eating. She modeled eating a range of foods and she probably had her own struggles with self-esteem, but she didn't really talk about her body in a negative way. And I think all these things have been very helpful and protective for me in the larger picture of things. Number two, focusing on self-esteem. Now, children that develop a healthy self-esteem will likely have the greatest resilience to managing pressures around food or body image. They will possess a tougher skin to handle the triggering environment, being less likely inclined to aim for perfection through body image or achievements. Now, as parents, you can help tremendously with self-esteem, building, by doing things like delighting and encouraging your child in the activities they find interesting, just by showing the love, appreciation and acceptance that your child needs, you're really giving your child the greatest gifts. You can regularly acknowledge as well your child's unique qualities and character traits. You can listen to your child and pay attention to what they have said. Children can be under immense pressure to achieve academically and it's easy for a child to begin to feel accepted for what they do rather than who they are. So it's so important just to, you might want to still value some of those achievements and those external things, but it's so important that a child feels good enough for who they are and that you can delight and find joy and accept and give them that acceptance. Now, even if you're doing an incredible self-esteem boosting job at home, your child will still have knocks from the world They'll have losses, friendship issues, possible traumas, all impacting self-esteem. So again, you can only do your best. You know, you can't control it all. And that can feel so hard as a parent, but it's the way it is. But self-esteem is the bedrock. A child with buckets of self-worth is far less likely to self-punish through punitive diets or extreme overeating because they will feel worthy, deserving, and loved. And if they do fall into these patterns, 
if they've got sort of stronger self-worth, they'll probably feel that they can ask for help, that they can be more vulnerable, that they can reach out and get support. So they know they deserve self-care and self-love and it will feel right to practice these things if they have that bedrock of self-esteem. So again, this is a tough call, I think, for parents. You know, we live in a society with so many pressures and you can be absolutely doing your best at home and your child is still going to be exposed to things that can really knock their self-esteem. But if home is a safe place, if home is a place where they can feel accepted and loved purely for who they are, that is going to be incredibly helpful, not just with their eating, but with their mental health generally. Number three, food rules at home. So as parents, again, you can feel immense pressure to get it right around food and government schemes around this don't always help with sugar being completely demonized and fears of your child becoming overweight. Of course, we want to raise our children to eat nutritious foods and to take care of their bodies. However, when food rules in the house are too strict, this can create anxiety and a stronger desire for certain foods. So children raised with especially strict rules around eating can be more at risk of secret eating, feeling ashamed or guilty for eating, and or feeling a loss of control around food when suddenly exposed to previously forbidden fare, maybe at like friends' parties or sort of social events. So creating structure and routine around eating is really helpful. So having a scaffolding around the day when your child eats meals and snacks, making sure that they never get over hungry, making sure that they get balance in their main meal so they are satisfied and fueled to get on with their day. Then of course as well, allowing things like biscuits, chocolate crisps, the fun foods in moderation. And if your child is fueled well, they're less likely to want to fill up on these foods. So again, it's like not labeling foods as good or bad and striving for that food neutrality. And it's modeling that balanced eating yourself. I think, again, this is really important. So I found as well in raising my own children that all the external messages, the things like healthy week in schools, all the diet culture messages will result in your child having some food morality issues because it's so indoctrinated by the culture. So my personal stance has not even been to talk too much about this, but rather practice modelling intuitive eating practices. So eating my main meal and then maybe, you know, allowing myself to have some chocolate afterwards, eating a portion of it, really enjoying it, delighting in it, you know, not talking about good or bad or treat or anything. It's just like part of my overall eating structure. So back to my listener's question as well. She was asking about her little one wanting several hot chocolates with marshmallows a day. So personally, my own stance with this is I wouldn't even get into numbers of what's allowed or not, as again, this could create a rule if you're saying you're only allowed so many a day. Um, So I wouldn't even talk too much about sugar or about health. So instead, create a time of day when you're maybe going to have this hot chocolate drink, serve it up with delight and joy, but also neutrality, no talk about health or sugar or how much we should or shouldn't eat. And then if your child sort of asks again half an hour later to have another one, just say really warmly and kindly, you know, you can have it tomorrow, do that with kindness and firmness. And and if they're still hungry, maybe you can suggest something else for them to eat or drink and then just simply move on. Don't make it into a big issue. So I found as well with my own children that we have a chocolate box in the kitchen and they are generally very moderate in their consumption of it. But I've never made it forbidden, but I'm also a model and encourage enjoying these foods after dinner or making them pleasurable and part of life. They aren't special or seductive. There is no naughtiness or secrets around eating them. There is no moralizing around health or sugar intake or anything else. And in time, they have developed a very relaxed relationship around these foods. So obviously, with a younger child, they will need some guidance and structure around their eating. Otherwise, they probably will just eat the chocolate box in one go. But I feel that this can be done through gentle guidance rather than having to enforce hard and fast rules. And I guess, again, you know, there is no perfect way to do this. I'm telling you a bit about kind of what's worked for me. Um, You know, you might want to do more reading, explore this, talk to other mums as well. Um, But I think the more we can just not make food a thing, the more it's just kind of part of life, something that's enjoyable, something that's, um, 
you know, just part of just everything that we are including and enjoying in life, it just makes it less of an issue. You know, if we go down the rabbit hole of talking about too much sugar or what's healthy or what's not healthy, etc., etc., it can start to laden on guilt, even if that's not our intention. Okay, number four, validating emotions. So as you can, validate your child's emotions daily. Now this sounds so simple and straightforward, but we often forget to do this. And possibly you might find this hard to do for yourself. So it can understandably feel unnatural to do this with your child. But it's really possible to learn this skill though. So validating emotions involves helping your child to express and name how they're feeling and then showing acceptance and acknowledgement of this. So you don't have to fix the situation or provide a solution, rather you're just being there for your child. So if your child is sad, for example, you might just reflect back, you feel sad and maybe give them a hug. If a child learns to express and manage their emotions, this is a golden gift for life. Your child will be at less risk of developing depression, eating for emotional reasons or restricting food to block feelings. Now, one thing with this whole validation of emotions as well, I have found that once my children have hit the teenage years, I've been absolutely ready and willing to be an emotional supporter in the background, wanting them to open up and talk about things, share their worries with me. But the reality has been that they don't always want to talk to me. In fact, I'm the last person they want to talk to. They want to talk to their peers. So they will talk to me occasionally, but it has to be on their own terms and when they want to talk. Now, this has been quite hard as well to come to terms with because I think, particularly when your children are younger, you're very used to kind of being their key person, being able to kind of really support and help them through things. Um, And it's been harder to be able to sort of like realize sometimes I need to take a step back. But in time, I've really learned to go with the flow of this and be there when needed but to offer breathing space when not. So I think it's that delicate balance, isn't it, of your child knowing that you're very much there as their number one supporter, but at the same time, you're not kind of constantly pestering them for how they're feeling if they just don't want to talk at that particular time. So with younger children, you can work to lay a strong foundation around emotional validation, and you may be able to carry this through to the teenage years. I think it's really dependent on your individual child. But if they don't want to talk to you as a teen, you can still be there in the background and know that you planted some beneficial seeds for their mental health and trust that these will grow. Um, So they may be in reality talking to their peers mainly and perhaps just talking to you only occasionally. So number five, media. So particularly social media is toxic. It doesn't cause eating disorders, but it definitely adds volatile fuel to the burning fire. And I have been struck by how many of my younger clients, and I'm saying I work mainly with adults, so I'm talking here more like my 17, 18, 19 year olds, compare themselves relentlessly and have a very fixed notion of how they should look, eat, behave, etc., due to social media. So again, a child with more rock solid self-esteem is going to be more protected against this, but I think that even the most robust person would be influenced by the deluge of perfected images. So of course, having open conversations with your child about airbrushing, manipulation of images and the pressures on young people can be helpful. You can talk about how things can be triggering for negative body image, helping your child to develop a protective filter to the media bombardment. You can also support your child in considering their values and to like themselves for their many qualities rather than just focusing too much on appearance. So you may want to limit your child's access to social media, I think particularly if they are younger. I found though that once my children have become teenagers, this is actually really hard to control and actually I don't think personally it's helpful to manage this situation with over control or too many rules because what's gonna happen is your child is like to rebel or develop a secret habit and then feel shame for this. So instead, your child will learn and moderate their own social media use through experience. And I realize that this is an immense challenge. But again, if your child can understand the impact on self-esteem, if they're developing interest in other areas not focused on looks, fitness and appearance, if they have healthy relationships with their friends, parts of life that bring joy and happiness, then the rabbit hole of social media is going to be far less of a draw. 
But I think ultimately we do need some kind of radical overhaul or intervention with social media as this 24-7 exposure is highly toxic for all of us and particularly, you know, for our young people. So I hope you found some of these um, points helpful and something to reflect on. So I'll just sort of summarise the main things I talked about. So number one was being a good role model and looking after you. And I would say that is the most important thing. Children ultimately will watch what you do much more than what you say. So you really invest in yourself. And um, it's okay if you struggle with your relationship with food. You know, you've probably been brought up in toxic diet culture. Of course, you're going to be struggling. You've probably had... Um, parents grandparents saying all kinds of unhelpful things and there's a lot of kind of undoing to do but even you having awareness and um, taking baby steps to improve your relationship with food and to protect your children from some of the things that you have gone through that's going to be incredibly helpful and you'll start to break that kind of generational passing on of diet culture weight stigma etc Number two, building good self-esteem. You know, a child with good self-esteem is going to be so much more robust and resilient against everything that is thrown at them. And I know this is a big ask in our big comparing culture. Number three, no good or bad foods. Really work towards food neutrality. Really work towards kind of like using intuitive eating principles. If you don't know much about intuitive eating principles, have a Google. It does really provide a really great framework for developing a peaceful relationship with food. Number four, validating your child's emotions. You know, if your child has good mental health, they are far less likely to use food or controlling their body as a means to try and feel better because they'll have healthier coping strategies. They will have learned from a young age that they can talk about how they're feeling, that they can talk to their friends, that they can use strategies that are helpful to them to soothe their emotions and look after themselves. So again, that's a really, really helpful thing to be able to support your child to do. And the last thing, number five, social media. Social media, as I've just been saying, it is toxic. It is such a huge thing to try and deal with. Your child will be influenced by it. It's um, with the best will in the world. And, you know, unless things radically change with this, you, your child is probably going to struggle with this on some level. But you can help them and educate them, provide open dialogue and conversation. And, um, you know, trust as well that they are going to start to draw their own conclusions and recognise what impacts their own mental well-being. And then they will start to make decisions, particularly as they kind of are moving out of the teenage years into adulthood to protect themselves more. So final words. As a parent, you cannot totally prevent issues with food or body image for your child. Life stresses will happen and events might occur that are totally beyond your control. Life is unpredictable and you can only do your best. So it's important to be kind and compassionate with yourself in supporting your child. You can't always get it right. And recognise your limitations and do seek additional help if needed. Okay, well I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at the eating disorder therapist underscore. And for further support with your relationship with food, do go to the eating disorder therapist.co.uk. If you enjoy this podcast, I'll be so grateful if you'd follow, rate and review as it helps it reach so many more listeners. Thank you so much for listening today and I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon.